we all have multiple apps in the system each of this in itself is a kind of a distributed system a big distributed system so if we have to build something like this kind of a distributed system so how will we do let's start with the most basic thing you have a small program in the that program is running on your computer and that is simply running on localhost that's your pc so it has some kind of data you are storing data in the form of file or maybe you don't have to store the data it is always in the main memory so you have a program which is running this can be simply similar to what you code for any lead code problem that you are solving it is a simple program like that now you attach a server to it so that it keeps on running the program keeps on running and it is running on a particular your pc and it runs until your pc is on and anyone can make a call to your this local host now what is the issue with this like why is not every app built like this why is not netflix just built on a pc and it has a simple data store in that pc and it is serving the answer is simple because there are billions of users using netflix and if all the people start calling the same ip it will crash so that's why there came the need of distributed systems so now we know we need some distributed systems we need multiple servers now okay so now if you had two two computers three computers jitte bhi add kar lo it will still fail if you are not properly designing distributed system that's why distributed system came into the picture and we need a big distributed system to serve the world level scale which is there so now before going to understand how to build this distributed system let's first cover a bit basics of how this request response is happening like if i am sending a request to a particular server or to a particular pc what you said what will be the form of this request what protocols will be used let's see that okay so everything in programming or everything any system is it is a combination of a request or response you send a request to access some of the some of the data or whatever you want to do and you get a response you do this in the form of api so if you are a software developer you already would know that you are using some apis which you have built in java python whatever api framework you are using behind this api there is always a protocol which is being used like in simpler cases in which there is simple request and then there is a response the protocol being used is http now there are other multiple types of protocols but there are for example let's suppose we take http now this is a layer 7 protocol so if you have studied in your engineering there are seven layers of protocols or oh, seven layers of a network in the seventh layer is the application layer fourth layer is the transport layer we just need to talk about these two other layers are so seven layer protocols are http xmpp smtp on layer number 4 there are just two protocols which is tcp udp on layer 7 there are other protocols also but i have just listed three on layer 4 there are just two tcp and udp so if you have read about these protocols good so in tcp the connection is made by handshaking the data which you send has a guarantee that it will reach because it it is a acknowledgement based protocol so whenever you send uh, create a tcp connection there is a handshake between the client and the server whereas in udp there is no such connection being made and the data being sent can be lost also therefore tcp is more reliable as compared to udp but udp is more efficient because you don't need the handshake so we'll talk about this so you simply send a request you get a response whatever api you use at the backend it is using one of these protocols it is if it is simple api it is mostly using http protocol now you convert this layer 7 protocols into any types of api calls rest rpc soap whatever you want to do now to create a tcp connection like i talked about there is a handshake required so first the user whenever you call the api behind the scenes this is happening so first there is someone sends that i want to connect the pc responds okay i got your request and an acknowledgement then the client again sends an acknowledgement that i have also got your acknowledgement and the connection is established now you can send the request response whatever so establishing this connection as you see requires a lot of network calls three network calls which is called a round trip time therefore establishing a tcp connection takes a lot of time and in many cases the api latency increases because of this time because suppose you are sitting in india making a call to a server in us it will take a lot of time this round trip time and whereas the server was in your vicinity itself so it will take less time 
that's why uh, people try to create their servers in different uh, continents so that this time is reduced the api call time is reduced this is one of the factors which is used to reduce this latency now we have talked about this request now this is a http request is going there are multiple servers how will you the client know to which server this request should go multiple servers are there because a one server was failing again and again and two servers also didn't do the job we needed more servers that's why we created multiple different servers now we don't know on which server to send the request because each server is running the same instance of the service but how will i decide i don't have a particular ip of a particular ip of a particular server on which i'll send request so how will we decide on which server the request should go that's where load balancer kicks in load balancer decides on which server the request which is coming it will go load balancers are also of different type we'll talk about them now you are making a call to the, actually the load balancer and the load balancer is routing your request to the servers now this is a simple http request but we want to make it secure with the help of https now when we include security we have to encrypt our request which we are sending now the question comes where will this request be decrypted will it be decrypted at the load balancer or it will be decrypted at the servers the answer is both we can do both so the first case is you send a request it is encrypted the load balancer has the key to decrypt the request it decrypts the request and then sends the request to the different backend servers and these are internally secured because they are in a private network so the load balancer is in the same network as the other servers so no security is needed so your request is decrypted on the load balancer this is called ssl termination now this why it is called ssl termination because secure socket layer the request was encrypted it got terminated at the load balancer now ssl termination can either occur at the host or it can occur at the load balancer so this is the case when we decrypted the request at the load balancer now what benefits does it have of decrypting the request at the load balancer so there are various benefits what you are doing is that you are decrypting the request now you can make choices in the load balancer on which server you want to send the request so you can see the request parameter and on the basis of that you can decide on which server you want to send the request this makes the load balancer also kind of something intelligent the other type is where load balancer doesn't know how to decrypt the request and the request directly go to the backend servers and they have to decrypt it this is called ssl termination on the host now in different cases people load different type of these load balancers what types of load balancer also there the load balancer also do different types one is layer 7 for layer 7 and layer 4 in layer 7 they have all the information about the request the application because they are the application they are access the application layer of the request but if they are layer 4 they cannot make decisions they can just make decisions on the basis of whatever data is present on the layer 4 so i have created a whole new playlist on the load balancer uh, i'll link it here you can see it so now you are sending an http request it is going to front end server through the load balancer and now it is finally going to the backend of the complete app which you are designing now suppose the backend is one big service we can divide this into different type of architecture monolith or microservices but let's first start with monolith a monolith is one big service everything is in that service all the business logic everything is there in that and you just have one service running on multiple servers so that's what it is now you make a call to the service now this service cannot have the file stored each server cannot have a file stored on them because they have to access some common data that's where the database kicks in because you cannot store the data on your server itself so you need some common database the source of truth which will be for all the servers that's where the database comes in now database can be of two different types it can be of all multiple types also for for just now we are considering mysql and a nosql database supposingly mongodb but it can be of other types also it can be used for analytics purposes there are database for analytic pur purposes which is column oriented something like uh, column oriented databases we'll not talk about them we are just going to the basics and these are supposed the two types of databases that we are considering mysql and nosql databases like mongodb now in mysql the data is stored in the form of rows and columns primary key is one of the column so For MySQL databases, you have read a lot about it in your 
colleges so what is mysql database it is nothing it is a database which is in the form of rows and columns in it there is a primary key which distinguishes a particular row from all other rows it has to be unique for every row now the internal structure of the mysql databases it can be b plus tree or it can be some other trees also or, or in whatever storage engine you, which you want i have a complete video on it in which i have discussed with arpit about the mysql databases and nosql databases for now let's just consider that the internal structure of the b plus uh, the mysql database we are considering it to be b plus tree for now now it is a b plus tree what this means being a b plus tree so how is the data stored you inputted a row how it is stored in this so you can created a primary key so this tree is built on the base of that primary key so for example there are various different words the alphabets are a to z so this tree is built on that logic only so the root node will be basically denoted all the possible words which are there and then all all the possible all, all the possible record which are possible and then it is dividing into left and right simply like we do so for example let's suppose a to e is in the left node f to z is in the right node something like that that's how it goes till the end and finally at the leaf node the complete row is stored that now this is this tree is created on the basis of the primary key the column primary key all the possible keys which are there it is created on the basis of that now what is an index now it is possible that you want to access the database you want to write the query select star from this database where some other column equal to this not the primary key some other column is equal to this so now you want to create a new tree you want to create a tree which is indexed on that particular column so in this case what happens is whenever you create an index in a sql database another tree is created in this tree the dictionary is the same as we discussed about but on a different column on different column name now the problem in this is will you store the data again in the leaf node now you are creating an index so will you be storing the data again in the leaf node do we even need that that would mean we are duplicating all the data which was stored again for the index that we have created so yes you can definitely if you have a lot of space but other way also can be that in the leaves you just store the pointer to the actual data wherever it is stored so these are two different approaches which you can take now relational database architecture now mostly the architecture is just one single node but like we discussed this one single node it is possible that this one single node cannot scale now if you are storing all your data in one single node you it is only possible to scale it vertically now relational database inherently support asset properties so in that a major thing is called consistency now this consistency can be maintained only if there is just one single node storing all the data but what most of the sql database if you will see that they are available they allow an option called read replicas so what are this that the write happen to this one node but the reads can happen to different nodes now these different read replicas they are not strongly consistent what this means is that suppose you write it to the master some row now you when you read you read from these read replicas but it is not necessary that you will always find that particular row which you wrote now to solve this there are various possible things that maybe you can try to search in the master node itself that particular node so basically you are dropping the constraint c called consistency to make this sql database scalable so this is one of the practices which is widely followed and this is the one of the architecture which is very common for all the people who are using sql databases they use it with the help of read replicas and it does not always support strong consistency now one of the major issues with the relational database is suppose the master dies what happens in that scenario in that scenario one of the read replicas is elected to become the master now we want to further scale this database now to scale this database there are two different ways one is vertical scaling in vertical scaling what we will do you will increase the type of the host which is present on master and read replicas you will in increase the capacity of the host you will increase the throughput of the host the os which it is using the ram etc all these things which you will increase of the host this is called vertical scaling another possible thing is horizontal scaling in this what you would do you would shard the database your sql database into multiple 
common multiple clusters each cluster is a different master slave architecture and in this you make sure that the data is such that that you don't have to join between the data in two different clusters so data in this will just be joined in this the data in that will just be joined in that so it is mostly done uh, with the help of geolocation so for example facebook geo shards its data and stores it in different clusters on the basis of the location of the post whatever it is there and it still works fine so this is one of the ways to shard your data some shard it in a way that the tables which are joined together they are kept together whereas the tables are kept in a different clusters so there are different ways to shard it now no sql databases no sql databases for example mongodb they are stored in the form of key value pairs it can be stored in the form of documents also so there are different types of uh, no sql databases mongodb is actual bson format bson is binary json so you input your data in the form of a json it converts it into binary and then stores it so it build, whatever indexes you build it builds in the form of on, on this bson data format now in no sql databases also the data can be stored in the form of b plus trees so that's what i have shown here that it can also be show, uh, stored in the form of b plus trees we have talked about all this mysql no sql in a separate video you can watch that also but since i'm covering all the system design basics i'm covering this also so in no sql databases you can also store data in the form of b plus tree now in this also mostly no sql databases people call that it is highly scalable why do we call it highly scalable because there is no first of all there is no acid properties compliance in this there is no compliance in that you are simply just dumping your data now this data is definitely sorted in by some key which you create and there is some structure of this b plus tree which is created that is on the basis of a particular key which you declare but this can easily be sharded so for example suppose you think that you will store data from a to d in one cluster e to f in another cluster and you created create a big a large number of different clusters which are storing different types of data now since uh, most of the times you don't have to join the data in nosql databases you have no issues with that because you can easily store it in different clusters and it easily supports your business function now if one cluster dies what happens now if one of the node dies so in mongodb also the data in one cluster it is in form of there is one primary node and the other are slaves so if one node crashes it can easily be replaced by the other read replicas so internally the architecture of one cluster of a mongodb and a mysql almost looks like the same now the next questions which we come across is now what if our data is also become slow and that's where we talk about caching and that will cover in the next video so in this video we talked about your local host then from local host we build a distributed system we got a load balancer now we needed single source truth of data for that we built a database now database we discussed two different types sql and no sql this is what we covered now we'll talk about cache in this series we'll cover all the basics jitne bhi hain of system design so that if you have to design any system you would think through this perspective ki kya kya you need whatever you need or why do you need you should know